Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of React Roundup. This week on our panel, we have Justin Bennett. Howdy, folks. Lucas Heisch. Hello, everybody. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. This week, we have a special guest, and that's AJ NS. AJ, do you want to say hi? <laughs> yeah, hey, guys. It's good to be in the React podcast. Hey, folks, I just want to let you know quickly about Netlify. Netlify is a really cool system for hosting what are traditionally known as static sites. However, the real benefit that I've been finding is that I don't have to mess with a back end. I can just set things up. I build the website out. I've been using a system called 11DJS and you just deploy it. And then anything that you have that you want to do, you can do on the front end. So if you want to pull in some kind of database with Firebase or something else, if you want to collect form data, Netlify provides all kinds of services that make it easy to do all that stuff. If you're trying to do serverless, they have a really, really neat serverless setup that will allow you to deploy your websites without having to deploy a backend and it'll do some of the work for you. I, I just I just love it. So if you're looking for a way that you can actually deploy a website that only has front end technology in it, gives you all the tools that you typically need for the back end without having to actually program the back end, then give them a try. Go check them out at netlify.com. Well, uh, do you want to introduce yourself real quick and then we'll start talking about Gatsby? Yeah, so I am currently still in college and I work on front end development primarily and I'm pretty passionate about trying to create, I guess, beautiful interfaces for the web. Yeah, so that's uh, that's it about me. Nice. Well, um, we brought you on to talk about this Medium article, <laughs> uh, why you should build Gatsby JS to build or why you should use Gatsby JS to build static sites. Sorry, I can't read and talk at the same time, apparently. So yeah, uh, I, I'm a little curious, like what prompted you to to write this article? So I had this whole uh, conference, which I attended uh, during the last year, around November, I guess it was in Tokyo. Uh, it was the Plone conference. So um, the thing was that I had hardly worked on Gatsby quite a bit. And my talk was like on Gatsby at first. And so everyone there was pretty new to what Gatsby was and a lot of them was uh, pretty new to the whole uh, the front end ec ecosystem right now like they were still like you know, just getting used to react and all of that so when I was talking about Gatsby it was everything was pretty new for them and uh, so I, when I did talk to them about all of this I realized that um, Gatsby solves a lot of issues and like helps a lot of new developers like enter this e the new ecosystem right now without actually complicating a lot of things and uh, I thought maybe I should like you know there's already so many articles and content out there about Gatsby but maybe I could add on to it by showing like how Gatsby makes like getting into the front-end development today pretty much easier because like if you look at react or like any other framework for that matter and you're getting in from uh, working on uh, where you used to work on something like template engines and the normal HTML, CSS sites, it could be pretty daunting to you when you see something like a, a React, create React app structure or something built on Angular or something of that. But Gatsby eases all of that for you. So I wanted to talk about that in particular, but then I covered through whatever I learned while I was working with Gatsby. So I thought, okay, all, I could compile all this up into an article and that's what it was. Yeah, one thing I just wanted to point out that I found a little bit ironic was that uh, mostly I see the static sites used for blogs. And you wrote this blog yeah. post on Medium, which is not a static site. But anyway, <laughs> that's just kind of my background, you know, with Jekyll and Hugo and some of these other ones. Um, about that, I really did want to create one for myself, but like aside for myself, but um, it's I'm still in college. There's a lot of uh, I really yeah. don't get the time, so I just post stuff I'm ready for now. Yeah, it's funny how time doesn't like get any easier when you get out of college. Though I've been telling yeah. myself I'm gonna I'm gonna make myself a blog for like so long now. Guess what? Still hasn't happened. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, it's just yeah, it's just fun because I also I also have a blog. It's been a while I don't write on it, but I'm writing a post now. My blog uses like a library called Metalsmith or something that generates the HTML. And one day I, I thought, yeah, maybe I'm gonna update it, use Gatsby or something like that. But then it was like, 
it's working so well the way it is now. There's there's an npm start that does the things for me. I drag the folder <laughs> somewhere else and it works. And the and the thing is that is interesting is that since it's it's a static, there's it, not even React on, on my blog. Performance is amazing, and SEO loves me. So there there are at least three or four. Uh, of my of my posts are like number one or number two on Google, and people would sometimes ask like, oh, what what did you do like for performance or like what did you do the meta tags? And I said like I actually didn't do anything. It's just like a plain HTML. Yeah, you mentioned dragging a folder, and I'm just gonna plug. I think they're sponsoring this episode. If not, they're sponsoring other episodes. But Netlify makes deployment really. <laughs> So you don't have to drag it around. You just, I've been using Eleventy, which is another static site generator. It's written in JavaScript. And uh, yeah, I just push to GitHub and it goes, oh, I know what to do with that. And it just puts it out there for me. So Yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah. To bring all these kind of points together. Um, so at Artsy, we have a design system and it's actually the documentation site for that is powered by Gatsby and deployed by Netlify. <laughs> and nice. both of those things together very nice, very nice. Netlify makes it where you like don't have to like basically worry about any deployment. You're just like run this command on these branches, done, and mm -hmm. it's like easy. Yeah, it's so good, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Netlify even has hooks or something with Gatsby right now, so you can actually set it up to build each time you make a change or like update your database something. So that's amazing, considering like you still get static data spit out at the end. Well, the other thing that's really cool about it is that my 11D project is public. I'm working on basically moving devchat.tv off of WordPress and onto 11D. And so, you know, it's public, so people can do pull requests to correct show notes and things like that. And I've gotten a couple of pull requests, and Netlify will actually build those as well and let me see them privately before I approve them. <laughs> so... It's got a lot of really, really nice features for that kind of thing. Yeah. If there is an option of having a static site, there's, it's like we're on a really good place now comparing to, to the past, right? So many interesting tools today for if you, if, if we can make a, a static website, we're on a, it's a good life. Yeah, I'm really interested in, so the React team this year is working on SSR improvements. And if you saw one of the last demos that the React team did, or maybe the demo before the last, they were showing off this example of this like really interesting React SSR example where React was only running on the server and there was no React in the client at all. It was a really fascinating demo and I'm excited about that specifically for uh, like static sites, because like Luke was just saying, you know, if you really want to get like high rankings and you really want to be up there, it's like not having to ship React at all is, <laughs> is a great thing. It's really powerful, right? Like make your page weight as small as possible. I mean, Re React is great and everything, but like when you have a static site, it's like, do you need it? I mean, thankfully, tools like Gatsby take care of like the really nasty SSR issues and all that stuff. And it's like pretty straightforward. But, you know. Yeah, but I, I don't even know. Maybe AJ know this better. Like, I think that with a GraphQL website works even without uh, React in the in the client. Is it is it true? I didn't exactly understand the question there because a GraphQL with a front end, like. No, no, no it's Gatsby. Yeah, yeah, the Gatsby. <laughs> yeah. Did, did oh, I say yeah. GraphQL? You did say GraphQL, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I, say, I wanted to say Gatsby. Yeah, I believe that like the the links between the pages and stuff they still work if you if you don't if you don't have uh, React loaded yet. Um, the thing about Gatsby is that it it tries to simplify things as much as possible for you, assuming like this is the way you would think it should work. So like it takes care of code splitting and all of that out of the box. So when you like have routes and all of that, you don't need to worry about like how do you handle them. Like if you're using a React configuration, you'd have uh, maybe React router or something. And then for SSI, you need more tools. But here Gatsby just takes care of all of that. 
So yeah, so uh, what's even more interesting is that when you have a lot of pages and you are switching between them, the page doesn't need to reload when you're using Gatsby. That also speeds up the site quite a bit because there's no reloads at all and it's uh, it also prefetches the data for you. So these are things that like, you know, actually things you'd expect to see, but it's hard to implement if you're doing it manually. So, like I, I felt that Gatsby does a good job in taking care of these few. So yeah. So I was just testing out our design system site with JavaScript disabled, and there are a lot of things that do work. So everything styled correctly. Clicking between, I can click between certain links. Um, so we have some menu elements that are like drop down. Those are React components, so those do not work, obviously. But like most of the links and everything still work and still load. So from that perspective, it, it works works fairly well. I mean, if that's a use case that you wanna you wanna actually build for, you you need to test it. So um, Gatsby provides this header, this like Gatsby no script header that you can style that'll like appear across the top of your site if like JavaScript is disabled. It says this app works best with JavaScript. <laughs> One thing that I'm curious about, and this is something that I've run into because I've used Jekyll in the past for static site generator. I've used Eleventy, like I mentioned. I've played with a few of the others. One of the things that I run into is just getting a good HTML template in there. So do you have any recommendations for like theming or things like that if you just want to kind of get quickly up and running with static site and then, you know, roll from there? Okay, so the thing about Gatsby is it's supported a lot by the community. They have an amazing community. So... It comes with the uh, what I'd recommend if you want to get uh, quick, like get started really quick, would be trying out a couple of the Gatsby starters. It's there on the site itself. Um, they uh, come with all sorts of functionality. Like if you want a blog, they have a blog specific one. If you want a portfolio site, they have one for that. So it comes with all these pre configured, and they're like really, some of them might be opinionated, but like they're still pretty much built for the use case. And if you're looking for something in particular, you could find it there. And you could just walk, uh, get that in, try to understand what's happening there, and then just get started with that. So I think that would be good for you. And if you already have a bit of idea on how things work, you can just, their uh, default starter itself comes with a lot of configuration out of the box. And uh, it only takes, it's like generating pages, templates, and all of that shouldn't take much work. It's, it's like working on a normal React app with JSX. Yeah. Um, so Charles, one of the things that you can do is you can actually define how like certain page types render in Gatsby. Like all your content is actually written in like markdown files or MDX files or whatever. And you can have like the, the header, what it, the front matter uh, header that like, corresponds to a certain like way of rendering. So that's generally how you you handle like different templates in Gatsby. So it's it's pretty easy. And and like AJ was saying, there's a lot of like templates out there and starters and like the community's huge. So there's a lot of good stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. The thing that I ran into with Eleven D, it's pretty new. And so I found a page template I liked, but then I had to go in and I actually had to put in all of the dynamic information it, it you know it runs off of markdown as well but it was oh put the content here and you know format this here and put this other you know and and all of that comes out of the front matter or is generated off of the front matter but yeah it, it's it's been a little bit of work and i'm still working through some of it and then also the other thing that i'm running into and this is probably something that people run into with gatsby as well is just figuring out how to do all the stuff that i have wordpress plugins for right now so things like social sharing and, you know, and so you have to find basically a JavaScript friendly API usage that, you know, will insert it into the page because you don't have a back end to back it up on. And I guess you don't really need that anyway for things like social sharing, but sometimes comments and things like that, you know, you have to go use discuss or, you know, some of these other comment systems to make it all work. And so that's been the other interesting piece for me is just saying, oh, okay, there's an easy plugin for this for WordPress. And now I've got to go figure out how to find something that will just insert with JavaScript instead. Well, I will say that Gatsby also has a very robust plugin system and there's a lot of really good stuff out there. So 
I was mentioning earlier uh, MDX. So MDX is Markdown with JSX embedded inside of it. So you can actually like render React components in your Markdown. Dang. It's really awesome. That's super nice. awesome. That's yeah. really nice. Um, but there's just a Gatsby plugin to make that super easy. And there's been like, there's, there's just a lot of really great Gatsby plugins. So for example, I was talking about Palette, our design system. We actually have this like pseudo CMS interface. Um, it's actually Netlify CMS, which is a CMS that just like runs off of GitHub. So we have like this slash admin route that our designers can go to and like edit like our documentation in this MDX like format. And then like once they save it, it like automatically commits to the site and like does a release and all this stuff. And it's like, you know, that's powered again by like Gatsby plugins. And it's like, it's super awesome. I'm going to have to check that out because that's the other challenge that I've had is that making the switch over, my show notes folks don't know Markdown, right? They've just been using a WYSIWYG editor. And so, yeah, I'll have to look into something like that where there's some visual editor, you know, through either, yeah, a CMS on the back end for Netlify or something else that will actually, they put it in there and then it just converts it to Markdown and commits it to the repo. Yeah, I dropped a... Um a link in the chat, but it's this project Gatsby starter TypeScript rebase Netlify CMS. It's uh, built by one of my coworkers who did uh, the work on Palette. So it like gets you started with a lot of things. So at RC, we use TypeScript for pretty much everything. And we use styled systems a lot. Um, so styled systems is just uh, like a CSS and JS approach that makes it where like your components have like style hooks. Um, it's, it's a really great library. But the author of Styled Systems created Rebase, which is or Rebase, which is a uh, component uh, component library that kind of builds off the of Styled Systems. And then this also has like the Netlify CMS stuff in it. So if you want to see kind of like what our setup was, this is like a bare bones like starter that you can like start playing with, and it's really good work. It's awesome. Very cool. Yeah, I'd like to add on uh, Gatsby, Gatsby. Like with the amount of plugins, right? You have a lot of source plugins which are amazing. Like you can basically, you were talking about how you could input data, right? You had a WYSIWYG editor and you want to input data. So it has a lot of source plugins which can basically fetch data from anything. Like you can look around in their plugin database and they have uh, plugins for Google Docs even. So like basically you give it data like in whatever way you see fit and it could pull it in. So you should maybe give that a try. Google Docs, that's a nice one. Yeah, that's yeah, a very approachable one. Quite a few interesting ones. I think they had one for Airtable. Like um, they basically, the community is coming up with different sources, which can be anything at all that can be sourced is can, can be used as a source in Gatsby at this point. That's actually really awesome. I haven't even thought about that. So what was it this week that Google uh, opened up their like enhanced automation workflow for Google Docs? So you can do like a lot of automated actions with it. Combining that with Gatsby would be really, really powerful. Yeah. It's a really interesting idea. I was Yeah, I was thinking about that the other day. Like I have a, a, one friend, he... he he has like this uh, company he was trying to to make like uh, oh I want to make like a website an app to for people to follow up with the things with the services and stuff like that and i was thinking like what should a person who who is not a programmer who has no no background in programming things what should they do like because like hiring someone to do and then you have like this black box that you never know how how it works I was thinking that in his case, maybe like something like if he only needs like to, to know about his users and stuff like that, it would be really great if he had like a Google Sheets with all the data and uh, the application would only like interface with the Google Sheets and stuff like that. And he could like add users, remove users from the Sheets and it would like reflect on, on the on the application. So... And that's not what he did, but I was thinking that this is this is probably like the one of the best compromises for when they're doing like smaller scale applications, because like he's not a programmer, but he's like a Excel ninja, right? People in a lot of different like markets, they are not like actual programmers, but the things that they do with Excel is really impress are really impressive. So you would get like the the best of both. That's awesome. One other thing that I'm wondering about, and this is something. 
that I recommended without really validating. My wife's stepbrother is learning to code and he's been trying to pick up JavaScript, among other things, kind of make the transition out of the work that he's doing right now, which is he actually works for a cabinetry shop and he basically runs their CNC machine. So he does some programming, but not it's not the same, right? He wants to get into web development, but he lives in this little teeny town in southern Utah, the closest, I wouldn't even call it a major city. I mean, there's a university there, but it's still not that big of a city. It's still an hour and a half away. And St. George, Utah, which is kind of the last, the last stop before you get out to uh, Mesquite and Las Vegas, if you're heading south on I-15, is about two and a half hours away from him. So there's not a whole lot there, but he's been looking for opportunities and he's got people in his city, in that, that little town, that want websites built for their businesses. And so he's thought about using a static site generator to learn how to write front-end code. And he wants to learn React, and so I told him to start playing with Gatsby. Is Gatsby a good way to learn React, or is that totally insane? So this was one of the, one of the I think, one of the major points I tried to convey through my article. So if you um, look at it, uh, the way that you have, when I went to the conference, I met people who were extremely like, proficient with, like they've used a lot of templating engines, they have used a lot of like the normal HTML, CSS, and all of that for websites. And when they saw the front end ecosystem right now, where we have all sorts of single page applications, it was pretty confusing for them. What you are internally used to when you're just starting out or like you're used to these HTML, CSS is that your idea of a website is a page with internal linking, right? You have different HTML files and you link to them with pages and you add on functionality with JavaScript, you style them with CSS, so that's pretty basic, right? And what Gatsby does here is pretty much the same. If you if you look through their starter and all of that, they have a pages folder, which is a couple, it's a bunch, which all of them are components, but they work the same way as uh, normal HTML does. And uh, this could be like, you know, the, when you have the whole approach similar to how the conventional sites work, I feel it could be a good way to start because you don't handle routing and all of the complex stuff and you just you just get used to the components thing, which is something that React like focuses on, right? So you can just try out Gatsby, try out with try it out with the with a basic, pretty basic static site, and you could get used to components and all of that in the process. That's awesome. I would I would kind of add to that though, as Awesome as Gatsby is, I feel like maybe it's not necessarily the best platform for learning React. That's not to say that you can't do it. And and definitely it's a good suggestion because the community is big enough and there's enough resources out there. So there's a lot of learning materials, but it has a different... I don't know. You're not building a whole site with React necessarily. You're you do build some templates with React, and the rest of it is just like you know these content files. And you know, I don't know. Maybe that's maybe that's ideal. Maybe that's what you want because you're not having to do too much React. But I mean, there's there's just a lot of stuff going on, and mm -hmm. I think like when I approach learning something, I try not to add too many other things to the learning queue because then I find that I don't really learn any one thing very well. And the thing about Gatsby is, so Gatsby is its own framework. It's like its own system with its own like rules and configurations and all that stuff. It runs on top of GraphQL, which is like a whole nother really complex technology. And then it has like React in the mix. And there's just like, it, it's an awesome tool, but it's also a very complex tool and like everything that's under the hood. Now they make it easy to use if you're kind of, familiar with like the sort of technologies that that surround it but i'm not sure that i would tell somebody who's like never touched like a website before or like never really started it's like yeah jump into this big like mountain of complexity and you know <laughs> throw out something yeah i remember like when gets be zero was around was still like not version one it was like very simple it was like the pages folder. You just try to start dropping stuff there. You can drop a markdown. You can draw, and and that's it. I think that the new version, the version that we are using today, is more powerful, but it's also much more complex. Like the GraphQL edition and stuff like that made made things 
you have like a lot of moving parts because the first one, just like next JS, it seemed like, oh my God, it's so much less complex than having a webpack, you know, because webpack was always like this nightmare to set up and things like that. But now I think that Gatsby has its own complexity, you're right. It's like, I don't think it's like the place to start and to learn React. I think there's number one, Code Sandbox. Number two, Create React App. You can't. I may have mischaracterized things a little bit because he has been (laughs) building his own kind of toy apps with React. What he's looking for is a way to build his resume in React. And there's nobody he knows who's hiring React developers who's going to give a brand new, no resume React developer, you know, a shot, especially remotely where, you know, the closest he's going to be, he's, you know, he's two, two hours from me and two hours from, you know, St. George. So that puts him about two and a half hours from Salt Lake city. And so it just, it's hard for him to have a company go, Oh, we're going to take a chance on you. And so he's trying to build that up. And so then he could at least say, hey, look, I did this with Gatsby and I've done some React stuff. So one thing that I would say um, for him and or other people who might be listening to this who are kind of trying to get started, especially if you're remote, there are really good opportunities to learn online. And it's not just resources. There are a lot of like pairing services where you can get somebody to pair a program with you remotely. So really, that's the sort of thing that you should look for. Engage with the community. If you see somebody who's like constantly like working on projects and you're stuck on something, just ping them and see if they'll like pair with you sometime. That is, to me, literally the best way to learn because they can give you a lot of context. It'd be hard to get otherwise. They can just like gut check you on like, is this a good pattern? Is this a bad pattern? Don't undervalue being able to pair program. And also, you can do it remotely, totally. So it's definitely a thing to look into. Yeah, I like that. I, I guess what I was looking at for him is then he could put a couple of projects on his resume that say React on them. But yeah, I, I totally agree yes, for that. I, I, I'd like to add on to like I agree totally about the complexity and the fact that if you're learning one thing, you shouldn't be messing it up by like you know adding more stuff. But when I was saying maybe you could give uh, React a try with Gatsby, I didn't mean that we add all the complexity in it. Like you don't need the thing about Gatsby is that it doesn't enforce you to use GraphQL or any of the complexity involved, which we're talking about the webpack bundling or any of that. Like when you actually start working on proper sites, you do. But until then, when you are just getting started, you really don't need any of that at all. So. What I was trying to say is maybe just if you're giving React a try on how things work with the components and all that, uh, maybe you should, you can just like, like the first version of Gatsby, which uh, is talking about, uh, you can still kind of do that. It, I agree there's a lot of complexity involved, but at the base, it's still uh, pretty much the simple parts which you can still u- use, even though there's so much around it. So yeah, it's the maybe the way you see it, maybe, maybe you're right. You know, you have to when you're learning React, you have to focus on learning it pretty well from the base up itself. But this is also a good way to experiment and like see the results and all of that, right? This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give you full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. I think it's an interesting discussion, though, because depending on your goals, it sounds like it may or may not make sense to go with Gatsby. It may make more sense, you know, like Justin saying, to go find somebody who can walk you through this stuff and kind of help you level up a little bit more before you, you know, dive in on this or dive in on some of the other options that are out there. I think if you're willing to seek for help and to talk to people, Gatsby is a great solution for getting started because of the size of community. 
the likelihood that you can find somebody experienced with it who is also willing to pair is much higher than if you do something like a little bit more obscure. You know, it's likewise, like if you were wanting to like stand something up, but you weren't really confident in like standing it up, like probably in general, one of your best approaches would be used to like WordPress because like everybody, pretty much everybody who's like touch any website anywhere has like at some point at least like looked at WordPress and like, you know, had some experience with it. So like there's a lot of resources and a lot of people who can talk about it. So picking popular tools, even if they're a little bit more complex, if you can get help and get somebody to, you know, pair with you, then I think that's a really great way to learn because when you hit that like iceberg of complexity, they can tell you the important parts to focus on so you don't like fall in a rabbit hole and just, you know, like completely derail your learning. So, I mean, again, for, for your friend and for anybody else out there, like if you're just starting and you want to learn Gatsby, you know, that's fine. And I think it's, it's an okay way to learn React too, so long as like you have a structured process and you don't get lost in like this underlying complexity. So having somebody to help guide you through that would be excellent. Yep. That makes a ton of sense. So do you think that Gatsby is like, it's like the default way of creating a static website today if you think about React? So if I think about React, I want to create a, 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 a static website, Gatsby is the way to go. No, I can't give you a short thing saying this is the, this is the absolute best. Like this is the thing that it worked for you for, you for sure. There is no, it's still opinionated. You have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of GraphQL involved, Webpack, and um, there are other options like there's React Static, there is Next.js, there, uh, there, you can even code it up on normal HTML, CSS, if you, if, if that's the case. Like, the thing is, it depends, all comes down to your use cases and what all you're looking for. And Gatsby does provide a pretty elegant solution to a lot of these problems, but it is not your one, like, you know, that's not the one answer to everything. So I wouldn't be endorsing it as, like, you know, the, the best, but it does solve a lot of problems just out of the box. So you could give it a try. It might be the, might be a good option for you, might not, but mostly it would be. So that's, that's all I'm saying. I would add, even in my case itself, where I work with, a couple of sta- like mostly I work on uh, like creative side so like uh, there is not much data pulling and all of that involved but I often still use Gatsby sometimes just because it um, cuts down on the work of optimizing images like you if you're you uh, just coding it in HTML and you have to get a responsive image out there you gotta make the picture tag. You have a couple of image tags. You resize the image manually, and all of this is—it's a lot of tedious work, which you know is some nothing that you didn't need to give thought about, but you still need to do it. So Gatsby automates all of this for you, and uh, it optimizes for performances and all of that. So in, in those cases, it could be really helpful for just you know helping you focus on your work, which is the design, and not focus on the tooling and all of that. So that's where Gatsby could help. And at the same time, I don't use it for all the projects as well. So maybe you don't even want all this complexity. Sometimes it's a pretty small site and all you want is like, you know, just the data represented and you just want to do it in the quickest way possible. You can still go back to your basic uh, HTML. There's nothing wrong with uh, a normal configuration. It's nothing bad if you don't use React or Gatsby or anything, as long as you try to like, you know, maintain the standards and keep it performing. One other thing I want to push on a little bit in the in the article on uh, the free code camp uh, medium is you, you say Gatsby can be used to build static sites that are progressive web apps. And I've heard a lot of people use a lot of different terminology and specifications to describe what a progressive web app is. So for you, what is a progressive web app? Um, I actually wrote another article on the progressive web apps themselves. So... Um, the main thing what people need to understand is it's not a separate app by itself. It's not a different uh, framework or tool that helps you build these. They're just websites which follow a couple of standards that make it behave like native apps. So to me, when you're talking about progressive web apps, the, the good features uh, to have would be it should be installable. Like you could uh, turn it up in your phone and it should show, show like, you know, do you want to install this app? And it, it should happen. That should happen smooth. 
There is the there's service workers which you can use to make the site work offline, as well as maybe handle background tasks like you know notifications and all of that. So that's where service workers come in. Uh, it could also be maybe configured into for caching and all of that. Another thing would be the performance itself. Like uh, if you are loading up a normal a native app on your phone, it's extremely performant and it has like fluid animations and all of that, right? So you try to make it as responsive and as fluid as a native app as possible. And all of these standards, when they're followed, I feel like you know you could classify it as a progressive web app. Makes sense. You hit most of the major points that I've heard. So, yeah. So, when why I mentioned this in the article was that Gatsby has a couple of plugins for this as well. They have this plugin called Gatsby Plugin Offline, which just if you just add it, it handles a lot of caching for you and handles a lot of things which you know would be pretty much a lot of work to configure on a normal React app. So that would be a good feature. There's the re- there's the plugin manifest to make your app installable, and like uh, there's a c- couple of things you can do which do not require the same efforts as they would if you're doing it manually. So uh, that's why it was I mentioned it as a a pretty good feature which Gatsby offers. Pretty awesome. So another thing that I'm wondering about, and this is my total noob question, folks. I play with a lot of technologies. If you look at the breadth of the podcasts on devchat.tv you kind of get an idea where does graphql actually come in with with gatsby right because i mean most of the static site generators that i've used you know like justin said it just pulls the data out of the front matter is it using graphql to do that or do you have some other sort of uh, data file in there that it 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 accesses that way or yeah how does graphql play in gatsby okay so if you just look through how Gatsby handles its uh, data processing, it would be that it takes the, it has the first step where it fetches all its data, all the data that's required from the source you specify. Like I mentioned the Gatsby source plugins, right? So if you have files, you could give those in. If you have a Google Doc, maybe that could be configured in. So whatever, uh, maybe even WordPress uh, itself as a backend. So all of these, you basically configure and this, the whole of this data is pulled into Gatsby. And then how you use this information in your app is uh, via GraphQL. So what GraphQL, the abstraction where it does is that it enables you to access all the data which you just uh, configured Gatsby to fetch. And you just the, the whole uh, philosophy of Ga- GraphQL is that just uh, you pick out what you need, right? Unlike REST APIs or something, you just ask for what you need and you get exactly that. So you do the same here. So if you have like five folders which are configured with the file system plugin to fetch uh, markdown files, another plugin to fetch WordPress data and all of this, all of this would be available to you through GraphQL. And uh, you can ask for what you want with the GraphQL query and you can use it. So it basically handles uh, trying to get whatever data, the exact data you need from this whole complex amount of information you are getting in by configuring your sources. So it does not actually, like if you, for very simple use cases, it's not even required that you use GraphQL, but it has so much power to it when you're working with a lot of sources or like comp- a lot of data. So that's where I feel GraphQL yeah, could really come into use. Yeah, it was a really novel use case of GraphQL for them to use it kind of as an internal API. That's like, it's kind of internal facing, but it's a way to like access all the aggregate information. So it's like, you know, when you build Gatsby in static mode, it doesn't actually, I don't think it actually references GraphQL at that point. Like, it grabs all the information it needs while it's building, and then the GraphQL part is like done. It's a really interesting use abuse. <laughs> One of those. <laughs> yeah, I like it. That makes a lot of sense. So, any other angles on Gatsby? Yeah, I'm working on, on a project here at Zocdoc, and I felt that Gatsby would not be the tool to help me there. So I'm going to let me tell you about one situation where maybe, so we have these pages that are like SEO, like landing pages that we need to, to, to also rock in the SEO realm. So if you look for like dentists in Utah or 
primary care doctors in Salt Lake City or New York or whatever, wherever in Knoxville. So you 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 reach those SEO pages for for ZocDoc, right? So I was thinking like, how can I bring this like next level in terms of performance and stuff? I was like, I'm gonna get to be those pages. So I'm gonna generate those pages. Yeah, I'm gonna generate those pages all like static and put all these HTMLs like in the in a CDN. It's server side rendered, right? So the combination and when I started doing the math was like almost 20 million pages. <laughs> So generate that that many pages statically was, let's say, not a good idea. Right. <laughs> so I saw like in the Gatsby blog, they talk about an e-commerce that is using Gatsby to, to build the whole website. So if, if they add like a, a product and it generates the website again, so like every product page is a Gatsby, it's a Gatsby generated static file, but they had like, I don't know, 30,000 or 40,000 pages, which is really interesting that, that Gatsby does not take hours to, to do that. It's like really good. It's impressive. But imagine like a, a large scale e-commerce or our situation here when you have like millions of possible pages, things get complicated. Yeah, but you don't have to just use Gatsby in generated mode, right? What, what, what do you mean? So I might be totally wrong on this, but so there is a there is like a generated mode where it like flattens out all the files and like has the the static rendered things. But can't you just use Gatsby like where it just server side renders everything, but like it doesn't do a generative thing on all the files? Like you can make you can make like dynamic some pages like dynamic, like they pull data, like you're still doing server-side rendering and you can use like template part or like markdown partials or whatever if I you need to, but saying. like, but like you don't have to do flat files for everything. Use Gatsby as your server, like Next.js or something like that. It can be similar. It can hand, well, yeah, I, I might I, be, I might be totally <laughs> off on this. I, I think it's an option though. Well, there's no reason why you couldn't load JavaScript into the page. Well, sure. Yeah. And then, you know, have it go hit some back end store. Um, yeah, I'm not yeah. sure how the routing would work because I'm not an expert in Gatsby. <laughs> but I think we're all yeah. hitting like the, the limits <laughs> of our Gatsby knowledge here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But this is like, this is the, the feats, the purpose of like working for performance. Like, I need the content yeah. to be like loaded on the first load, right? So even before anything. Yep. So, but sometimes I think about, about that. Is any static generator solving that problem of having millions of pages? So they would, the, the way to solve the problem is maybe incremental building somehow. Maybe if you don't change, if you're only adding contents, you don't need to, you don't need to generate everything. Like that, that would be like a really interesting problem to, to uh, solve. A lot, of the, a lot of these systems will do that. The, the trick comes is like when I deploy to Netlify, it rebuilds all the pages. Oh, okay. It rebuilds everything. And I don't know if they have an option. I haven't looked to see if they have an option for like incremental builds, right? Where, But but when I'm doing it on my own machine and I run the, uh, I've been doing 11D, but I do 11D watch. And so if I change one markdown file, it will only update that one. If nice. I change a template file, then it will update everything that uses that template. So. I feel like for a large scale amount of amount of sites or, or amount of pages, there's probably a different way to like approach yeah. this. Having like some pre-rendering like layer that like sits in front of requests. So like as a request goes through, like you know the it initially renders the page and like the pre-rendering layer like caches it or something or you know utilizing yeah. edge caching. Like mm -hmm. there's a lot of like yeah that's yeah. it. Gatsby does have some sort of caching. Even I, this is something which even I haven't really explored yet. So I even I, I can't give you some answer to this. But like when I worked at Plone, they I was working on their plugin for which fetches data from Plone, which is a CMS like WordPress. So mm -hmm. we did test it out on a site which had like some thirty thousand pages, and Gatsby does have a pretty good ha mechanism for handling its cache where it um 
prefetches all the images and all of that so that like you know it uh, cuts down on the build time but it still needs a bit of configuration and uh, i think there's a bit of complexity to it which like you know you wouldn't uh, i don't know you you can't deal with it like directly you would need to do a bit of research and all of that but yeah maybe you could like you know check it out and there should be someone who's done it already there yeah so uh the thing that that we are planning on doing is still server side render the pages but cdn cache them so because mm-hmm. in in the oh. end they 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 will build it's it's just like you it's the same effects of generating like it statically, right? If you cache the output of yeah. a server side rendered page, you have like the same effect. Yeah, yeah, as long as you clear your caches or clear the CDN when you have new stuff. Yeah, yeah. You need to put some smart caching strategies and this is a difficult thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> even if you even if you just have a really short TTL on your cache like it can still offload like a lot of traffic so yeah, yeah. like a um, 10 minute cache can do wonders yeah yeah at my last job so i worked for the company that owned like hetv and food network and you know they were getting like millions and millions of page views and they were able to offload like something like 80 to 90 percent of their load by just yeah. having like a 10 minute ttl on edge cache and that can yeah. that can do a lot and- at B2W back in Brazil, people knew that like if you turn if you turn off the cache, the site is down. The site cannot yeah. even get near to the load of page requests that, that that is coming. It's like if there's no cache to the it's a it's a giant e-commerce, right? Like Amazon sized e-commerce. I believe that like if you turn off like a caching for Amazon page products, Amazon would probably break. Which is really crazy to think about. The services would would not take the load. Yeah. That yeah, that's what it said. It's like less than ten percent of the requests actually go to to the servers. Yeah, but if if your uh, your data and your website function, you know, works that way, right? Like in your instance, right? The doctor's not changing their information that often, so it makes a lot of sense to do it that way. Yeah, actually, like this is the puzzle we're trying to solve because the availability of the doctors change, right? Mm-hmm. The data does not, but the availability change. So this is this is the puzzle I'm trying to solve now. Sounds interesting. <laughs> I'd love to hear how you do it. We have a follow up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After the project's live. All right. Well, anything else we want to hit before we go to picks? I know that uh, some of us have some uh, time constraints here. AJ, if people want to follow you online, where do they go? I'd say Twitter. I'm a J A J N S zero eight. So yeah, that's me on Twitter. Awesome. This is add one last thing. On like you know, like there's every you can see a lot of frameworks and libraries getting popular pretty quick on the internet these days. So uh, what I'd like to say is you shouldn't just jump in and be like this is the best and you sh- everyone should use this. So about Gatsby itself, a um, couple things which I found was that for a pretty basic site itself, if you are using Gatsby, it could still, as much as it simplifies a lot of things for you, it does complicate the structure quite a bit. Like you have to create a lot of components, you have pages, you have um, styling, all this handled in a React fashion, which could complicate things. And sometimes you don't actually want this. So forcing yourself to like, you know, just follow what's latest and what's mainstream would like actually cause you more strain than making things easier sometimes. So that's one place where, you know, Gatsby could complicate things. And other than that, another thing which I found is that people, a lot of people don't understand that Gatsby uses static rendering, which means that it's not just... It's not like server side, but rather on build time itself, it spits out HTML, CSS. And so a lot a lot of React libraries, which might work when you're testing it on your system, might not work in production because of the fact that they are not optimized for like, you know, server side. So these are a couple of issues which you might face and like it is actually something you should give a thought about before jumping into like, you know, this framework just because it's so popular and it does a lot of things. Cool. 
This episode is brought to you by TripleByte. Applying to programming jobs sucks. You have to put the right keywords in your resume. You spend hours and hours on the phone screens and take home projects. And that's assuming the company even responds to your application. Well, if you're a software engineer, TripleByte can help. They work with over 400 top tech companies from big names like Dropbox and Adobe to exciting startups. You do one brief online interview with them. And if you do well, you go straight to final interviews with the company on their platform. It's like the common app for software developers. TripleByte does not look at your resume or where you went to school. All they care about is if you can code. I've helped dozens of software developers with various credentials get jobs. And this looks like a terrific way for you to get in and get interviewed and get a job without a lot of the hassle and overhead. You can go check them out at triplebyte.com slash react. That's triplebyte.com, byte as in eight bits. As a special offer for listeners of this show, if you take a job through TripleByte, they'll offer you a $1,000 signing bonus. All right, well, let's do some picks. Justin, do you want to start us with picks? Sure. Um, so today I'm going to be kind of on topic. Um, so I mentioned the Gatsby starter, TypeScript, Rebase, Netlify, CMS, Mouthful. So this is by a coworker of mine, and this is kind of like the basis of the similar sort of setup that we use for Palette, our design system. You can also see Palette on GitHub. That's completely open source. We try to make all of our decisions in the open for this. So if you're interested in design systems or you want to see what like a, a Gatsby setup with like CMS integrated looks like, you can definitely play around with that. Look at the things we've done there. One other thing. So I've been working on performance this quarter and we had had issues with duplicate dependencies being shipped in our Webpack bundles. And the problem really with that is it's really hard to know when that happens. Um, so like we just found out we were shipping like four versions of Moment.js, which is like scary. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. Terrifying. So there is a great Webpack plugin from Formidable Labs called Inspect Pack. So it like generates a report of like all the duplicate bundles in your payloads. Um, so it'll tell you things like how many of these bundles were resolved by Yarn, if you're using Yarn, uh, how many are actually like installed on your hard drive and how many times that are depended on. It's a great tool and you really need something like this because there is no other way to know when a dependency is duplicated. If you do not have a plugin that will alert you for this, you are shipping multiple things in your bundles. Like it's almost guaranteed. So I highly, highly recommend using this or a similar Webpack plugin. And that's my spiel. One, nice. one, one, one small, small question about that. Do you use NPM shrink wrap on your internal dependencies? Um, no. So we're using Yarn for everything. We don't use uh, shrink wrap. So we have like lock files via Yarn. Like Yarn has a um, like a flat install mode um, where it can like mm -hmm. dedupe all dependencies and you can only have one version. We also don't use that for various reasons. So right now the answer is no. Yeah, because the npm shrink wrap file in particular, right? It gets uploaded also to to the npm uh, package manager. Right, and then if you if you install a library that has a shrink wrap there, they will they will need like a specific version of dependency, so they don't do the they they, they don't enter the algorithm. So it's crazy. Like there was uh, one library I don't know remember which library, but it was, it was like three point eight point three, and there was also three point eight point one installed because it wasn't a shrink wrap. So we need to be careful with those. Yep. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Lucas, do you have some picks for us? Yes, I have a pick. It's a library that I came across uh, this week. I was uh, looking for animation contents, and I came across this React Spring library for animating stuff in React, and it's really amazing. So it's, it's a really good... React interface, it's really well done. And I just saw today, I didn't see this this before, I just saw today that uh, they also have like a hooks API. So there's some hooks learning also available with this, with this library. So it works pretty well. It's pretty amazing. Nice. 
All right, I'm going to jump in here with a couple of picks. So I have been getting into um, video lately. I've only been audio podcasting for like eight or nine or 10 years, but I've really been getting into video and just really wanting to get more video content out there. So I have a few things that I'm looking at doing, but uh, one of them was just talking to the camera and creating videos that way. And that that's kind of what the DevRev has been for me. You know, So I've been posting those to YouTube and things like that. But uh, besides the camera that I got and kind of leveling up my production that way, the other thing that I've been doing is I don't even have this stuff yet and I'm going to pick it because I'm so excited to get it. And this is stuff that I got on Amazon. So I got some LED lights. They're kind of for photography, I guess. But anyway, I'm, I'm super excited about them just because then I can get kind of a consistent lighting situation in here. The way that this room is set up, I have a light fixture pretty much directly over my head. And then I have the window right in front of me, but I have four screens in front of me. And I'm looking to rearrange all this stuff. And so uh, I want to use my high quality camera. But the other the other thing that I have a problem with with this particular camera, I have the Canon EOS M6 camera, is that it has a screen that you can flip up from the back so you can see what's being recorded while you record but I have a shotgun mic sitting on top of it. And so I can't actually see the screen to see if I'm in focus or things like that, right? Anyway, so I, I ordered the lights and uh, I'm trying to find the exact model so I can tell people what it is. And we'll put a link to it in the show notes. So it's the newer, N-E-E-W-E-R, and they're bicolor lights. And then the other thing that I got, just because I'm thinking that it might be kind of fun, and uh, I don't like having the closet doors behind me as a background, is I also got a uh, green screen to go behind me. So anyway, that, that should be fun. They're both that same brand, newer, and I'll put, I'll put links to them in the show notes. But uh, yeah, I already have a frame, and so you just clip the material on, and, and that's what I'm uh, looking at with the green screen stuff. So anyway, I kind of rambled about that a little bit, but... Uh, Anyway, so uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and pick those. And uh, yeah, definitely check that out and uh, have a look at The DevRev. And you can find that, or you should be able to find that at thedevrev.com. AJ, do you have some picks? Do you have some things you want to shout out about on the show? Yeah, so I have uh, been working with design systems for a while now. And so I'd like to share this pretty cool tool, which we're using internally. It's called the Storybook. I'm pretty sure you guys would have heard about it. So what it basically does is provide an isolated environment for each component you're building. Say, like in a design system, you have an input component. You can just take that component out alone in this environment, check out its props, and if you, you can even add on documentation using one of the plugins there. So because we didn't have much time to like, you know, wrap, use a configuration with Gatsby or some sort of documentation and all of that separately, just using Storybook with a doc gen so that you just have, uh, you just comment out whatever documentation you have on all of that. And it just shows everything pretty well. Like I think IBM's a carbon design system uses something similar for their React code base. So we've been basing it off that. Uh, so I think it's a pretty cool tool if you are getting started with design systems and you don't want to like you know set all the a lot of complex things up because this handles pretty much a lot of things for you like the documentation, the props, and the checking out each components individually, the different states, and all of that. So yeah, that's Storybook for you. And other than this, um, I work. Um, I. I, I do a lot of uh, try, I try to uh, try different things with the web. So recently, I've been into trying a motion design on the web, and so I came across this pretty handy plugin for After Effects called Body Moving. So what it does is you design some animation or, uh, or something interactive and all of that in After Effects. And you can directly export this into an SVG, an animated SVG, by just using this plugin. It just works. So I found that out pretty cool. Yeah, so I think that's it from my end about picks. Yep. I said that sounds cool, but I was uh, muted, so you didn't hear me. <laughs> anyway, very cool. Well, thanks for coming and talking to us about Gatsby. This has been a lot of fun. Definitely something that I want to go play with a little bit more. 
And uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and wrap this one up and we will catch everyone next week. Yeah, I'm glad to be joining you guys. It's been a great, it's been great talking to all of you. Yeah. Yeah, you too. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more. Mm-hmm.